Okay, hello everyone and welcome back to history. This time we are going to be talking about Qing Dynasty China, which is the second lesson of our early modern China unit. So let's do a brief overview of the Qing Dynasty. This was the last imperial dynasty of China. It followed the native Ming Dynasty and is often referred to as the Manchu Dynasty because the Manchu people from Manchuria ruled. The dynasty began in 1644 and ended in 1911-1912 because there was, I think, a brief reinstallment following the 1911 Xinhai Revolution. Under the Qing, the empire tripled in size from the preceding Ming Dynasty, which was from 1368 to 1644. The population also tripled, growing from around 150 million to 450 million. The Manchus accepted and mixed into Chinese culture, consequently their rule was more easily accepted. And here you can see the extent of the Qing Dynasty in 1850. Um, they were bordered by the Russian Empire, India, and the French Indochina and Korea. So Qing expansion. In the 15th century, uh, Ming China did not utilize the opportunity of the voyages of Zheng He to construct a maritime empire in the Indian Ocean. This was later done by the European nations, starting with Portugal. So Zheng He's massive fleet was withdrawn after 1433 and it was left to wither. In the 17th and 18th century, however, China built a different kind of empire on its northern and western frontiers, which tripled its sides and incorporated a number of non-Chinese peoples. This expansion was undertaken by the Qing Dynasty. Dynasty itself was of foreign and nomadic origin, coming from regions north of the Great Wall. The wild and the Manchu takeover of China was facilitated by widespread famine and peasant rebellions due to the later Ice Age towards the end of the Ming Dynasty. What happened was that there was a rebellion. The Ming officials cannot put down the rebellion, so they asked the Manchu people for help. And uh, on top of helping the Ming Dynasty pull down the rebellion, the Manchu people also just destroyed the Ming Dynasty and started their own dynasty. And having conquered China, Qing rulers sought to maintain their ethnic distinctiveness by forbidding intermarriages. However, their ruling elites also mastered the Chinese language and Confucian teachings and used Chinese bureaucratic techniques for governing. For many centuries, Chinese people had interacted with nomadic people who inhabited the dry and lightly populated region known as Mo Mongolia, Xinjiang, and Tibet. Trade, tribute, and warfare ensured that these different worlds were well known to the Chinese. Chinese authority in the area had been intermittent and frequently resisted. Then, in the early modern era, the Qing Dynasty undertook an 80-year military effort from 1680 to 1760 that brought these huge regions solidly under its control. It was largely security concerns rather than economic needs that motivated this expansion. During the late 17th century, the creation of a substantial state among the Western Mongols, known as the Zongurs, revived the Chinese memories of an earlier Mongol conquest, which as you know was the one of Genghis Khan, and consequently expansion was revealed as a defensive necessity. The eastward movement of Russia also appeared potentially threatening. This danger, however, was resolved diplomatically with the 1689 Treaty of Nurchinsk. And here you can see a Treaty of Nurchinsk on the bottom, bottom right is the boundary between China and Russia over time. And the yellow region was lost. Uh, the original boundary was the red line on the top that's determined by the Treaty of Nurchinsk, but they lost the yellow region in 1858 following the Tr Treaty of Aiguan, and they lost the Red Region in 1860 following the Treaty of Peking. So the Qing campaigns against the Dzungar Mongols marked the evolution of China into a Central Asian Empire. The Chinese, however, have seldom sought of themselves as an imperial power. Rather, they spoke of the unifications of the people of Central Asia within the Chinese state. Overall, historians have seen many similarities between Qing expansion and other cases of early modern empire building, while also noting some clear differences. We will be talking about these other empire buildings, which are mostly European, in the next unit. The conquered regions were ruled separately from the rest of China through a new office called the Court of Colonial Affairs. 
Like other colonial powers, the Qing made active use of local nobles, Mongol aristocrats, Muslim officials, Buddhist leaders, as they attempted to rule the region as easily and cheaply as possible. These officials sometimes imitated Chinese ways by wearing peacock feathers, decorating their hairs with gold buttons, or adopting a Manchu hairstyle, which was resented by many Chinese people who were forced to wear it after the Manchu takeover. Here are some Chinese paintings of the war against the Zungurs. There's quite a few of these. Here are just a few examples. International conflicts. Uh, so there have been several international conflicts in uh, Qing history. The first uh, major one of them is the First Opium War, which started from 1839 and lasted until 1842. So it happened because Chinese officials banned the selling of opium into China, angering the British as opium was their only way of profiting from China. In the war, China was defeated and forced to sign unbalanced treaties with the British, which lost them a lot of land and money. The second uh, Major international conflict is known as the Anglo-French War, which lasted from 1856 to 1858, and it is sometimes referred to as the Second Opium War. It was caused by the British and the French starting a conflict due to the Chinese Navy capturing a British ship. Many historical artifacts were destroyed in this war, and China was defeated. Uh, and then the third major conflict is the Sino-Japanese War. Uh, it started due to conflicts on the possession of Korea and the Chinese Navy was once again defeated and forced to give away territory and money. So a few other examples of conflicts within the empire is the Taiping Rebellion, which was a revolt against the Qing Dynasty. It was led by this person right here. He made a group called the God Worshipping Society that seized the city of Nanjing, but the Qing Dynasty ultimately crushed, crushed the rebellion, and it led to like millions of casualties. The Boxing Rebellion is another example, and it was to eliminate foreign influence in China. So they went about doing this by kicking out or burning foreign missionaries, or just and getting rid of foreign influence. And this rebellion also garnered support from the Empress from the Empress, and it failed to, like the Taiping Rebellion. Okay, so Qing culture. From the time, from the beginning of the Manchu rule, uh, from the beginning, the Manchu rulers attempted to adopt Chinese culture. This led to a period of collecting, cataloging, and commenting upon the Chinese traditions of the past. Decorative crafts declined to increasingly repetitive designs. However, techniques, notably in jade carving, reached a high level. Despite the prevailing attitude of conservatism, many Qing dynasty artists were both individualistic and innovative. They shared a strong preference for personal expression above all. Qing porcelain displays a high technical mastery. Among the innovations of the period was the development of colored glazes. These include copper red, which the Chinese called Boulong red, or Ji Hong, and the French uh, ox blood, uh, or I don't know how to pronounce that, but also apparent are two classes of painted porcelain ware, known in Europe as fa fa female worted and female rose from their predominant green and rose colors. Uh, the literature of the Qing dynasty, just like in the Ming, focused on classical forms. The Manchus conducted a literary inquisition in the 18th century to root out subversive writings. Many suspect works were destroyed and their authors were jailed, exiled, or killed. Romance and adventure novels used common language developed substantially. After Chinese ports were opened to overseas commerce in the mid 19th century, which was a result of the Opium War, translation of foreign works into Chinese increased dramatically. Music, uh, the Qing developed uh, Jingxi or Peking Opera. These musical works placed combined 
several uh, regional music theater traditions and used various music instruments. Performers sang this in Mandarin. The style was popular with commoners, but gained a stature because of them first dowager Cixi was a patron. And that's the end. Thank you for listening, and we will see talk about talk more about the Qing Dynasties later years next week. <laughs>